from a raw business perspective, this is actually super sick. <laughs> yeah. Was, you know, it's like, I don't have any payroll costs attached to this. And like I paid for my rent and my salary in the first 24 hours, <laughs> um, you know? And so. Hello friends. Today we have the honor of interviewing Max from Narrative Coffee uh, in Everett. So um, Max actually first approached us through um, our Facebook group and actually shared with us some insights about how he was able to kind of change things around. Uh, but I'm not going to spoil that for you guys. So now actually, let's just welcome Max. Welcome, Max. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so it was really uh, actually inspirational when you actually shared with me that, you know, you were you were repurposing some of your uh, products to be able to sell uh, back to the mass market in, um, in effect to the whole COVID-19 thing. So uh, why don't you tell me a little bit more of a story of how you started your coffee bar and when this whole COVID-19 thing hit, like what was your mindset like? Yeah, totally. So I guess the start of our coffee, of our coffee bar, we had a, a pop-up shop. Uh, in kind of a park in downtown Everett. Um, we launched that on uh, July 4th, 2016. And um, that we did that for a few months. And then I found a brick and mortar space. And I've been kind of looking, you know, and spent forever trying to find a good spot and finally found one that was perfect. And, you know, it's really, really beautiful. I mean, you can, I can kind of show you a quick little view, you know, it's like wow. what, it, what it looks like now. So, um, you know, I walked it by the space, like, man, this is incredible. You got to have it, you know. And so we, started kind of doing the build out process and um got open in june of 2017 mm. so, so like uh, 11 months yeah yep so kind of the you know we do specialty coffee we do like a multi roaster coffee bar model um and so the idea with that was just to introduce everett to specialty coffee and um kind of build a culture here that hadn't really been established yet um mm. so everett's kind of a working class town um you know it's it's um outside of Seattle, it's about 45 minutes away. A lot of people call it a suburb. It has its own culture and its own kind of economy and, and it's fairly distinct, but uh, it's certainly close enough for people to live in Everett and commute to Seattle, um, which definitely happens. And we can talk about that in just a minute. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we've been working really hard at building community here. And um, you know, as we've seen our revenues go from uh, when we launched, I think we did 34,000 um, and we, we hit 67,000 um, a week. Uh, well, a year or a month, okay. excuse me. A, mo a month, yeah. a month, okay. Yeah, I was so like, was wow, pretty, good, good. yeah nothing crazy, oh, but um, yeah, that'd be nuts if it was a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we've seen steady, like solid growth and people have just been treating us really well. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been really great to serve the city here. Um, you know, kind of throughout this process, we've kind of had a few different iterations. We launched a, a food program, like a from scratch kitchen. Um, so that's gone really well and people have been really supportive of that. Can you elaborate on that? Like, so you're offering food items? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have like a full breakfast. Everything's made from scratch. Like we make our own mustard, you know, <laughs> a little, wow. little stuff. And, um, so that's been really, really great. And I um, hired an amazing chef who's just done an incredible job. And, um, yeah, we launched What's that. the mindset? Sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but what's oh. the mindset in creating things like that? Because like, you know, it's something that I've always been uh, preaching to, to our uh, audience. And I want to hear from your perspective. What's the mindset of creating more food items? So um, it was kind of a twofold thing. Uh, it was always originally in the business plan to make something like that happen. Um, maybe not quite to the level of execution that it's happening now. Um, but for me, the, uh, you should never start a business just because you want to start a business, right? Like so many people, like it's been their dream to start this thing and, um, and they've saved up their life savings and then they try to go into a place that doesn't have a need for that. And then they watch their dream become a nightmare and they just lose everything they've ever saved. Um, so for me, being a, having a good business is always about filling a need, right? And, and determining where the need is and filling that need in a way that uh, brings value to people's life. Um, you know, and so for me, it was looking around and saying, okay, like, what are the needs of our community here? What do, what do people need and want? Um, you know, and it's like, you hear people come in and say, well, like, do you have more food? Um, and we have a our county building is across the street and our city building is right across the street. So there's, you know, like 3000 employees within half a block radius of here. Uh, you know, and a lot of them just wanted to go out and get some food on their lunch break. Um, you know, so finding a way to do that, that fits within our ethos of quality and, um, product has been, uh, a whole different, you know, it's been a, an important thing for us to do. Uh, it's helping us fill that need for, for our guests. Um, and then finding ways to do that in a more like speedy way has also been a really important thing too. So 
Wow, good for you for actually knowing your customers and actually feeling their demand rather than, you know, a lot of the people that I mentor and, and work with, they always have this crazy idea of like, yo, I make the sickest bagels and I just want to bring it to the world. But then in reality, it's not really coming from them. It should actually be coming from the customers of what they want and us as the entrepreneur to fulfill the needs and bridge that gap. And I think like that's really the mindset that you were able to do. You came into the building, you feel like that, hey, you know what, I want to satisfy this type of customers and this is exactly what you're providing so you know that's perfectly the way that you're doing and executing and it's freaking amazing so thank yeah. you for that yeah no i appreciate it I, I think there's something to be said for doing what you're passionate about and being um excellent at it uh mm. you know and, and and i don't think there's anything wrong with doing a passion project as long as the market will support that and there's a need for that thing that you're passionate right. about. Um, but you can't you can't force things a lot of times and and there's a balance too of like well if you've established yourself sometimes you do things out of a uh, practical nature so that way you can do those things that you're passionate about right um, you know i provide food so that i can pay the bills so that i can bring in those 65 dollar pound geisha coffees you know <laughs> like there you go there you like go. right like so there, there's kind of a balance but um yeah i think it's both and not necessarily a one or the other but uh always serve a need rather than just trying to you know pursue a passion project for the only the sake of passion Totally. So, okay, business is booming. You're making like, you, at your peak, you're doing like 67, 70K a month. Um, so then that's amazing for you guys. And you, you're able to find that need. And all of a sudden, this whole COVID thing hit. Yeah. Tell me about that thing. Tell me about it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. It's been, it's been weird. So, Everett uh, actually had the first case in the United States. Um, so, it happened to land on my birthday, uh, January 21st. <laughs> uh, a local person within a, a mile of my shop. Um, had come back from Wuhan and um, had been paying very close attention, actually. He was very responsible about the way that he kind of handled himself, but he'd been paying attention to what happened, saw some symptoms start to come up, so he called the hospital, and um, they had a like a quarantined-off room that they had built for the like e Ebola outbreak uh, that had its own separate you know ventilation systems and everything, and so he was the first person to ever use that, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, But January 21st is when he first came here, uh, which happened to be the day that they locked Wuhan down as well. Um, and so, you know, it's like, I, I, I'd had some passing familiarity with what was going on. Uh, but I, you know, we were trying to find the right balance of knowing when to, when to engage. Um, but that was kind of the start for me of like, okay, let's, let's begin thinking and planning about this and, and trying to be prepared for it. Um, and so we, you know, paid really close attention to what was going on. And, um, I remember right the moment when the first case of community spread hit, that was the moment where I was like, okay, we have to change things right now. Um, so we, you know, we got together. Um, I'm part of a, another group on Facebook for um, kind of baristas in the area. And there was kind of some conversations happening on that too, about some various practices that people could employ to um, help prevent the spread of this and um, just to stay on top of it, you know, and, and to me, um, good customer service and in any good relationship is about managing expectations, right? And so um, it's helping understand what the expectations are and how to, how to manage them in a way that's fruitful for both parties. And so for me, uh, at that point, we, we began changing some things in the shop. So we have a, an honor bar um, that uh, it's a kind of a walk-up coffee bar. It's self-serve. It has its own kiosk so people can check themselves out. Um, and so like it's two bucks, it's dirt cheap. Um, and that was actually one of the first things that we ended up taking away because, uh, you know, it's self-serve. And, uh, so we wanted to kind of remove that potential for infection there. Um, we have like a kid's toy bin and stuff. So we pulled that back. We went through a number of changes. We started doing hourly disinfecting parties. We called them san sandy parties. So we would just like on the, every hour on the hour, we'd stop everything that we're doing and sanitize every touched surface in the shop. Um, everything major. You know, and it was, we communicated that to our guests um, just to say like, hey, like we know this is going to be a little bit slower. Uh, we're doing this for everyone's safety. And so we we're really involved in that really early on. Um, and we saw absolutely no business change whatsoever um, all the way up until the dine-in ban went into effect. Mm. Um, and that happened on March 21st. So we implemented our kind of our strategies early March. I think it was first week of March, maybe. Um, maybe in the end of February. Um, and we, so we, you know, we were planning for that. Um, and so we'd seen whenever Amazon and a lot of the tech companies, um, they sent their employees to work from home. So mm -hmm. a lot of people stopped commuting into Seattle. Um, and so, you know, the folks that were, that live in Everett, but commute, do commute to Seattle, they were now around. And so they were coming out to support us. 
uh, and they knew that it was okay for them to be here because you know we'd taken a lot of extra steps um, trying to pay attention um, to what was going on. So uh, that was that was really critical and I think really helpful for our for our guests, uh, and it helped us maintain our kind of revenue streams while I saw a lot of other places not able to do that. And I, I don't think that there's necessarily anything that like. It was because we did these things. But there was certainly an element of luck as well, but um, but no, just being not on top of it and paying attention certainly didn't hurt. So totally, and that's something that I really want to commend you on is the fact that you overly communicate, and I think that's so, such a big thing when it's like managing people's expectation is such a big thing. And like, you know, thanks for bringing that up. And you're definitely on the on, on the front end uh, of the bus for sure on this whole thing because a lot of people they. They, they, uh, they're oblivious. They're not really listening to these things because they have this kind of like um, confirmation bias that, hey, you know what? Things will be fine. I'm not really being open to see what might possibly happen. And for you to take the precaution to actually sanitize every single hour, not only does it really help with the situation, but also it also shows the guests and gives them the confidence to come and dine in at your place, which when things are going south, they feel confident that, yo, man, Max knows his stuff, like he's going to take care of us. And that's the type of stuff an entrepreneur needs to do is to adapt in, to every single situation. And you know what? Like, just want to commend you for that. Like, Thank you, Anna, yeah. forefront of this whole thing. That's awesome. Yeah. So, okay. Now that, um, you know, uh, prior to closing, you guys are still doing fine. And then all of a sudden, you know what? You get slammed with a hammer. What's happening? Yeah. Yeah, so the so the governor dropped his um, pre. So uh, it was a Sunday night. He announced that the the next day he was going to enact a, a dine-in ban, preventing people from dining in in locations anymore. Uh, and eighty percent of our guests stay in the cafe. Um, so you know, realizing that was going to be happening, we pivoted immediately. So Sunday night, you know, he had a press conference. I was I left my house, uh, drove into the shop, and started getting it ready to do curbside pickup, uh, and kind of get ready to pivot for that. So we immediately were ready to go. Uh, I made like some little janky kind of signs. There were like pickup signs. I texted the mayor's office and was like, "Hey, can I like convert a couple spaces in front of the shop, like parking spaces, into curbside pickups?" And they just said, "Absolutely, yes. Whatever you need to do, just do it." Um, so they were super supportive for that. And, uh, so we did that, and then um, yeah, we we literally launched curbside that next day um oh. you know so we had we had had plant we we changed our pos system in january uh, over to toast which is kind of a i don't know if you have it up in canada or not but um it's it's got a really nice built-in online order platform so we yeah. were we were kind of tentatively launching that previously but we hadn't like really hit it hard um so everything wasn't quite dialed the way that i wanted it to be but it was one of those moments where it's just like our, you know what, like we're going. So we just hit it hard and um, people were really supportive. And so we, we worked through that. And that first day, you know, on the Monday, we, we had a normal day. Um, it was even a little busy for a Monday, um, which was wow. really amazing. Uh, but then on what Tuesday. Was, what yeah, was your ahead. mindset like when, when that when that hammer hit? It's, it Was it like, oh, damn, like I, I'm gonna, you know what, let's just shut down. Let's just see this whole thing blow by. Or were you like, oh, damn, like, how can I take care of my guys? Like, or like, how yeah. can I take care of So, like, we, so we'd had a, you know, we'd had a staff meeting previous to that and kind of had conversations about what our overall plan was, you know. So before we, you know, launched all those kind of changes to our guests, we'd had that conversation with our staff, right? And just mm. like, hey, like, this is kind of where, this is our, our overall plan, right? So we had a plan of attack um, that wasn't based on necessarily governmental decrees or anything like that. You know, our, our, our plan had seven steps in it. Um, and toward the back end of those steps was closing down the lobby anyway. So this was already on our mind. This was something we were prepared and ready to do. Um, and we were, we were mentally okay with the idea of it. Um, and I knew that our staff would be okay with um, kind of being open and, and continuing on. Um, but we obviously wanted to make sure that our staff was being taken care of during that time um, and felt okay and comfortable. So it was kind of constant check-ins and making sure everybody was doing okay, you know, and, and kind of touching in with people and seeing how they were feeling at any given point in time. Uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a crew of 10 people, um, you know, so it's really important for me to stay in touch with each of them and, and figure out kind of how they're doing and um, where, they're, where their head's at uh, and everything. So that, that really helped. Um, so having that kind of knowing that staff was okay was good um but um and doing those frequent check-ins was helpful because there were a, there was a point where 
people started being more uncomfortable. And that was kind of um, what ended up driving our decision. We actually closed down the shop. Um, mm -hmm. But that actually happened toward the end of the week. So Monday, business was as usual, basically, but we launched this curbside pickup thing. And then um, we, so Tuesday was slow. It was a very slow day. We were, we were down about 50% um, on Tuesday. And so I was like, okay, I gotta be ready for things that I would rather not be doing right now. Um, and so that was kind of the moment where I started preparing. Like, it might be necessary to, depending on how the rest of this goes, kind of lay some folks off while they have the support from the government um, and getting things taken care of. Uh, and then we can kind of see how things go. And so that was kind of the moment where I started having that kind of thought and plan. And, you know, I talked with my managing staff and we were all kind of aware that that might be a possibility. And so we were, you know, uh, keenly on top of it. Um, but that was the moment where I was like, okay, this might need to happen. And kind of the rest of the week stayed relatively slow. Um, so by Thursday, I think I had walked through the numbers. Um, I, you know, modeled out our financial position to see where we were at with our cash flow, uh, with our, you know, our cash basis and um, just to see what our buffer looked like. You know, we'd had a decent year the, um, in 2019. And so that gave us enough buffer where I knew that we could close up if we need to. I, you know, I could pay all my staff. I could make sure that they're all taken care of, still have plenty of money to pay for rent and that sort of thing. So we're trying to find that like careful line um, and just know where we were at financially. Um, so that way we can make wise decisions in that regard. Okay. I want to pause you right there yeah, because you're, you're doing everything by the textbook and who, is there anyone that you follow to have these business acumen? Because it's really like up there. I'm not even kidding. And I appreciate that. Um, like, I, I wouldn't say I, f I necessarily like follow anyone in particular. Uh, I have a couple of business mentors and they've always been super helpful. Um, but to me, you know, coffee is my passion. It's what I love and it's a craft. But um, since I've become a business owner, be, running a good business is also one of those things. And just having a good understanding of like keeping this place in, in good, good health and always being prepared, you know, um, <laughs> like I grew up in the Boy Scouts. So, you know, there's, a, you know, the motto is always be prepared. And so just thinking careful planning and, you know, you, you plan for the worst and hope for the best has always kind of been my, my general hope. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's like it, you can only control your own controllables, right? So you have to pay attention to, to what's going on around you that are uncontrollables that might impact your controllables. And you have to make those decisions based on what you have control over. Um, you know, it's like, I don't have control over how the government decides to do this. What I do have control over is my own understanding of the situation, mm -hmm. understanding how they're making decisions and trying to get in the mindset of the people who are making these decisions and anticipate those things, right? So I'm like looking at all the data, I'm trying to analyze what, what's all available from epidemiologists and having an understanding of what might be coming so that way we can plan for it and be prepared. It's so, so good because like I, I've been preaching this all along where you need to know your business health. And I, I made a, a few different videos about like, Hey, business health is super important because you know, cash flow is your oxygen without cash flow. You're going to be like down, like you can't have a business without the cash flow and yeah. without understanding your expenditures that were without understanding your, your burn rate, without understanding like how long can you, can you be in business for or close down for and actually still have the ammo and yeah. your war chest totally. back on top. Like this is something that is not sexy. That's why people don't do it. And it's like, it's boring. And it's like, yo, I don't want to read my, my books. I want to sell more coffee. Why am I slowing down? Why am I doing this? I need to figure stuff out. I need to have marketing, marketing, marketing. And yeah. that's what people focus on is the sexy stuff, the marketing stuff, but not really understanding their vital signs. And that's really what is key in essence in, in doing the, the preparation in terms of marketing, in terms of pivot and knowing the numbers of, like how big are your margins and what can you really do? So thank you for sharing that. And, and this is a yeah. key example in real life of how these things are actually unfolding. And not a lot of business owners, especially in food and beverage, actually do what you're preaching because it's just not sexy, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, so after the fact that, okay, you know what, you did that and um, then you figured out, hey, you know what, what are some of the tactics I can use? to actually go and fight them. And, and one of the tactics would be, you know, um, selling your gallon lattes. Yeah. Think about that one. That's freaking amazing. Yeah. So um, I, I guess I want to finish out kind of the chronology of where we, where we'd been. So, right. Yeah. So on Thursday uh, I had sat down with all of my staff and walked them through the numbers just so that they could see it. You know, it's like open up the bank account, open up our P and L's, open up everything. They just said like, here's where we're at. 
um, here's kind of our strategy and where we can go from here. And, and here are some markers that we're going to need to see in order for us to maintain what we're doing. Um, and so we kind of started playing it by ear. So we watched carefully on Thursday, kind of what was happening financially, checked for Friday, Saturday, we had an awesome day. It was back to normal. Um, it was a great day. It wasn't like our biggest day ever, but it was totally sustainable. Uh, it would have kept us, you know, we would have kept going. Um, we had a number of guests that I knew for a fact were COVID positive that were coming through our curbside pickup and um, trying to do like our in-store thing. And that was the moment where, um, you know, my staff started feeling much less comfortable and I started feeling uh, a moral imperative to make a decision um, because at that point, you know, it puts my staff at risk and it puts our community at risk. And there's a very real reality for me where I, I've committed to my staff to take care of them. Um, you know, and, and if they work for me, then, you know, it's like, I'm doing whatever I can to help take care of them. Um, one of those things has been trying to get health insurance, uh, cause the way that it works in the U S is that, uh, most employers have to provide health insurance. Uh, and so we've been working really hard toward that. And I, we finally been in the financial position to be able to have those kind of conversations. So it actually been like doing research and started having conversations with insurance brokers right before that nothing had been leveled. So I have staff that don't have insurance and I have people who have this incredible disease that's not healthy and not a good thing and potentially life threatening. Um, it's like, okay, I like, this is the point where I have to close. So, you know, we were, we were actually recovering from a financial from a financial standpoint, we were going to be okay to stay open. Um, but that was kind of the moment where we had to say like, okay, I think we need to close for a period of time just to help uh, encourage And there's also this weird, um, and I'm sure other restaurant and food and beverage business owners have felt this, this like cognitive dissonance that I was feeling mm -hmm. where like the, all the, all the healthcare professionals, all the epidemiologists, all the government um, decision makers are all saying like, you need to stay home but we want you to remain open as an essential business, but it's like, okay, how am I supposed to tell people to stay home, but also tell them to come out and support my business? Cause I need a lot of people to come here for me to stay open, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I was feeling that like weight of the cognitive dissonance. I had a good idea of what like our financial position was and how we would uh, be able to recover. And so I knew that like, it would be okay for me to make this decision to close our doors. Um, so ultimately that's what we decided to do. Um, good on you, buddy. Thanks, man. Good on you for making the right decision. Good on you. Thanks, I appreciate it. It wasn't an easy one, um, you know, oh, and it definitely, not. you know, it, it definitely gave me a, a little bit of extra grace for the decision makers at the top. Like, damn, like this was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make for a team of ten, let alone three hundred million people. You know, <laughs> um, right? Like, I can't imagine the weight of that. That's so unreal. Um, but anyway, that was kind of what we ended up deciding to do. Um, and I had had an insane four months previous to the whole COVID thing. That's a whole nother topic for a different day, but, um, I slept for a little while. <laughs> yeah, I caught up on sleep and that was super helpful and needed. So, um, this is kind of where we find ourselves, uh, with, you know, last couple of weeks was just the shop being closed down. Um, all of my staff are taken care of. They got unemployment. They're actually doing fairly well on unemployment. Most of them are making more money than they do working for me, <laughs> which is kind of a you know funny situation. I've been super on the front of understanding all of the helps that are coming forward in our like economic stimulus packages and understanding kind of what's going on there. Um, you know, we applied for in the United States, we have the PPP, which is the payroll protection program. Um, and so uh, I'd been super on the front of that. We applied immediately with our local bank. We actually got approved for it. Um, that money's only helpful insofar as I have staff actually working though. Um, and so um, we still haven't actually brought anyone back to work um, in the shop normally yet because we're still kind of waiting to see how everybody's feeling. So now is kind of where we're getting ready to do another ch another check in with my staff and say, hey, like, how are you feeling? Are you ready to try coming back? Um, if not, we have some potential options for how we might pivot. Um, but in the meantime, um, we started doing this um, half gallon latte um, thing essentially where I'm, I'm making just a ton of lattes selling them in the half gallon portion sizes um, and so I launched that uh, what two, I've done this will be my third batch so I will launch it two weeks ago essentially um, I expected 25 to 30 orders you know it's like the price points of them aren't exactly cheap you know it's 22 mm -hmm. dollars for our basic one and then up to 33 dollars for an alternative milk one wow. uh, so you know it's not exactly cheap so I kind of expected that um, you know, we would maybe sell 25 or 30 of them uh, for folks that were just like diehard and just wanted to support us. Um, we sold a hundred in the first four hours. 
A hundred. A hundred in the first four hours. Um, overall, the first day, I, I launched them Friday or Thursday night. Um, and so uh, by the time 24 hours had I rolled by, we'd sold like 140 of them. Um, wow. All in all, we sold 157 for the first run. So I was up literally all night on Friday <laughs> making <laughs> making lattes. I slept on my on the couch at the shop for like two hours <laughs> and just was literally making nothing but lattes for that entire time. Um, That's even better for you guys, actually. Yeah. Higher uh, ticket costs and it's grab and go. Yeah, totally. So it's actually from a from a raw business perspective, this is actually super sick. <laughs> yeah. Is, you know, it's like I don't have any payroll costs attached to this and like I paid for my rent and my salary in the first 24 hours um you know and so the next subsequent rounds have all just been making up that money that we lost in March you know we took an $18,000 loss in March um just with the way everything happened we actually did a bathroom remodel <laughs> and starting in January that took super like it was supposed to take a week and a half and it ended up taking two months but we finalized that in March and so that payment came out in March and so that was like a huge thing and then obviously we had a short month um and so you know it's just all of those factors combined to to be a loss for the for the for march um so you know it's like i'm trying to recover that and my goal for this year has been to hit 10 percent profit margin we hit six and a half percent last last year so well 6.62 um but my goal is to hit 10 percent this year you know which is like the golden standard for food and beverage industries and i really want to hit that this year um and so i am not slowing down on that goal it's like we're gonna hit that whether you know i don't care how else everything shakes down we're gonna hit it um so that's kind of been my goal and, and this has been really helpful for that for that end um you know it'll, it'll put us in a better position to take care of our staff and do those things that we've been hoping to do how, how sustainable is this half gallon thing for you guys like is it still does it have that same uh, same kind of gas and steam uh right when you began is it like recurring so far, yes. Um, I've, wow. I'm getting ready to kind of put them all out again. I, I can follow up with you and let you know how this next round goes. Um, right. The second, the second week's worth. So I think of them in terms of like a week. Uh, you know, mm. like we only do one day pickup and one day of delivery. It's on Saturdays, so that way, well, I have time to do other business things. You know, it's like all sorts of things. There's a number of opportunities that are showing up too. So trying to look into those opportunities and and make wise decisions on those if needed. Um, so, you know, it's like, a, there's a lot of business things going on, keeping track of all the government things that are happening and applying for loans and grants and all those things. Um, you know, so like having to do all those things and I'm also involved in our, like our downtown association. So volunteering for that and staying up on meetings with that and help, helping um, the board, you know, do things there. And so um, I need to leave space for that. Plus I have kids and a family and, uh, you know, so it's like, uh, it's just been really helpful from a sustainability perspective in terms of putting all of my work onto a couple like big moments and it allows me to have flexibility throughout the rest of my schedule. So I can come in and prepare these drinks whenever I want. Um, but then I just need to be here during the pickup window and then um, for deliveries. So, uh, and then it's been amazing for deliveries. Um, we've had one of my, our chef actually, she's volunteered to just help go do deliveries and my wife has been doing deliveries too. And, um, so people have just been super supportive and, and willing to come help and it's been awesome. So, yeah, that's amazing. I think like you, you have it dialed down and the fact that you didn't give up, you know, a lot of actually business owners, especially food and beverage, they, they kind of give up and they just kind of throw the towel in yeah. because they feel like there's nothing they can do. And it is in a very dire situation where, you know, when things close down, they're like kind of, there's two types of people that I've, I've seen, like those that put in their towel and just be like, yo, there's nothing I can do. And the, the other type that's like you, like Canlis, uh, marking them and they're like these guys are like actually adapting to the model the rules of the game have changed yeah you need to adopt it that's that's the only thing and yep. business is all about problem solving anyways to begin with so you know what and just understanding the rules and playing within it or even outside of it is the best chance of, of survival for for that matter and um you know that's amazing that what you're doing right now just keep everything afloat and you know having the right spirit do you have any kind of final words to, to our audience and something that you want to share an actionable tip that, that you're yeah. like, yo, this is like good stuff. Yeah, man. So the thing that I'm, I've been thinking about lately is the, the, it's, I kind of think of it as like the law of conservation of mass, right? Like, like mass never change, like disappears. It just changes. I think about uh -huh. that the same thing with needs, right? Like the law of conservation of needs. Our guests needs are still there. They've just changed shape a little bit. So now the question is, is how can I fill their needs now 
um, as, you know, in this new model. And to me, that's where the rules of the game have changed is that the needs have changed. So now it's like, how do we meet those needs? Um, and I've loved seeing the way that some people have done that. You know, I've seen like a, a market-based approach where people are supporting their suppliers and, and offering um, like a grocery or a pantry um, through their, their, their business um, and meeting like their, their people's needs through that means, um, you know, like delivery services, People have been doing bike career things. So like the, to me, that's, that's the big thing is find the need, find where your people are at and understanding what their needs are and, and try to fill those in a way that, that takes care of both your staff and your community at the same time. Um, and I think that people will support that um, because they, they believe in it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all your golden nuggets and your trade secrets that, you know, like it's to you and, uh, and just being generous with, with, with this and also your time as well. Um, yeah, for the people that want to follow your journey, um, how can they follow you? Any, any handles? Yeah. Yeah. Um, on Instagram, our, our business is narrative.coffee. Um, that's also our website, narrative.coffee takes you right to our website. We're on Facebook, narrative coffee, uh, Twitter, that as well. Uh, my personal handle, Maxwell A. Mooney, um, across all, all the platforms. Um, if you're a latte art nerd, I have a, a latte art account called Seed Bearing. So yeah, that's it. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I really appreciate it. We'll definitely keep tabs on you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Take it easy. Take care.